Hello, welcome to this video. And on this video, I'm going to be telling you about 10 forgotten jazz rock classics. And believe me, these are all absolute classics. Some of the albums on this list are some of the greatest jazz rock albums I have ever heard. Right, some of this stuff is really, really obscure. And um, I've just tried to shoot this video <laughs> and I've had to stop and start again because I know very little about some of the artists on this list, so um, I'm going to have to tell you about the album and move on, but hopefully you will get a big list of incredible albums to check out. At the end of the video, I'm going to be telling you about an album that I think is one of the greatest jazz rock albums ever made, right? I also think it's one of the greatest progressive rock albums ever made. But on top of that, the story that's attached to this album is one of the strangest stories I have ever come across um, regarding jazz rock or prog. So please stay to the end because I'm really going to go into detail on this last album. Um, and I'm sure you're never going to, never heard of the artist and never heard of this album. And it is mind blowing. Anyway, let's start on my list. So the first album I've got is by Steve Grossman and it's called Terra Firma. And it sounds like this. So Steve Grossman it was a saxophonist that emerged in Miles Davis band um, very, at a very young age. He appears on Jack Johnson. He was thrown in right at the deep end in one of the most important stages of jazz rock. After he leaves Miles' band, obviously coming out of that band, he gets a record deal and in 1974 he records an album called Some Shapes To Come, which is an incredible album. On that album is the great Jan Hammer and he plays some incredible Moog and organ and piano stuff on that album. It's a very free album, it's a very out there album, okay? And it nearly made this list until I found about an album even more obscure than that called Terra Firma that came out in 1977. Now this album is a much more tightly composed album, it's a much funkier album and Jan Hammer absolutely flies, as does Steve Grossman. I always felt in Steve, with Steve Grossman, in the Miles Band, he's incredible, but he is really pursuing a certain line within his playing. He, his um, vocabulary is, is sort of limited. Um, I think him being so young, as he moves forwards, he's developed as a player, and he's gone to a much more sort of established hard bop jazz sound with his playing. By 1977, he has that sort of virtuosity. The saxophone playing on it is absolutely incredible. But Jan Hammer is off the scale. If you are a Jan Hammer fan like me, you need to check this album out. Some of his great Moog playing, right? But the thing is, this album's very free. It's just really loose, funky grooves, um, you know, pretty harmonies. And Jan Hammer is able to really stretch out on this, you know. so. If you're a Jan Hammer fan, it's essential, very funky album, very free album, great album. So that's the first album I've got. The second album I've got on this list is by a Spanish band called Iceberg and it's called Sentiments and it sounds a bit like this. Right, so um, this album came out in 1977. Uh, Iceberg were a band from Barcelona originally and they were formed in 1974. They made a number of albums which are all absolutely fantastic. And on those albums they pursue a sound which is somewhere between prog and jazz rock with a very strong Return to Forever influence and a strong Mavish Orchestra influence. On this album sentiments we really hear the Mavish Nooks drum. This is the most bombastic heaviest out there album that they made. It's very eclectic, it goes through a lot of different um, moods but it always keeps coming back to this really out there playing, there's some really fast alternate pick guitar all over it 
and some incredible heavy mavish new tight unison passages it's quite virtuoso in places this is a really incredible band they made you know i think four albums maybe five and then they disbanded in 1979 um, I have been told about this band for years by uh, prog and jazz rock aficionados. I've been checking them out recently, recently, sorry, and this is a great album. And if you want to start with Iceberg, check out Sentiments from 1977, an absolutely monumental album. The next album is from an artist that I featured um, in my video called When Jazz Rock Stars Get Naked, right? And this guy is called Eddie Henderson, and he's a trumpet player. So the last time I talked about Eddie was in a very sort of comedic way, uh, which is a little bit unfair. Eddie Henderson came to prominence in the Mawandishi band with Herbie Hancock. The Mawandishi band was a sort of post bitches brew band that Herbie put together, um, which was pretty out there, pretty free. Um, which he eventually disbanded and went down a much more commercial route with Headhunters. But amongst jazz rock fans, the three albums they made, Marandishi, Crossings and Sextant, are absolutely classic albums. Eddie Henderson in 1973, which is around about the time that um, he was, uh, Herbie was disbanding the Marandishi group, he makes an album called Realisation that sounds like this. So what we have here is a very dark brooding post Bitches Brew, post Miles Davis, you know, jazz rock album. There was a number of artists at the time making albums in that style. We could think of Early Weather Report, but also Joe Zawinul's um, solo album. We could think of the Moandishi band. Even if you listen to Zappa on Waka Jawaki and you listen to the improvisation, you can hear that Bitches Brew influence. Or go and check out something like um, Miroslav Vitas's early albums, or even Caravenserai by um, Santana. There's a certain sound in the early 70s, which once the Mavish Doctrine came out and sort of really set the sound of fusion, disappeared. But a lot of these albums are seen as absolute classics by jazz rock fans. Now, this album, Realization, I believe is up there with any of them. Um, it features pretty much the Mawandishi band. We've got um, Eddie Henderson on trumpet, flugelhorn and cornet. Bernie Maupin on bass, clarinet, flute, alto flute and tenor saxophone. Herbie Hancock on electric piano. Patrick Gleason on synthesizer and organ. Now Patrick Gleason was the sort of synthesizer expert that was in the Mawandishi band providing all these out there sounds. He crops up later on on the Lenny White album Venusian Summer, you know, and he always adds something to an album when he's on there, this sort of psychedelicness that he brings in. Buster Williams on bass, That's, this is pretty much the Mawandishi band and uh, Billy Hart on drums, and there's also an appearance from Lenny White. Right, I'm gonna stick my neck out. I love the Mawandishi band albums. I love that band. This album is up there, and for me, this may be my favorite of the sort of post Bitches Brew band. It's an absolute monumental masterpiece, right? Anyway, let's move on, right? When I did this list, I wanted to pick albums from the 1970s, you know, that sort of been lost in the myths of time. Uh, but I came across this one album that came out in 1988 by a guy that I know nothing about called Tam Navoda with a bunch of musicians on it that I know nothing about. But what piqued my interest is there's two guests on this album. There's David Torn and El Shanker. Now, David Torn is known for being this sort of ambient guitarist, ethereal guitarist, really incredible player. And El Shanker is, of course, the virtuoso Indian classical violinist that uh, came to prominence in Shakti. But this album doesn't sound like that. It sounds like this. So you can hear, this is a really strange album. Doesn't sound like 1988. It's not afflicted with all the horrible 80s production stuff that ruined so much um, jazz rock in the 80s. Can't even call it jazz rock. So much fusion in the 80s. And it doesn't sound like it's, it was recorded in the 70s. This is sort of post-Mavishnu, avant-garde, um, 
jazz rock, you know, there's tons of like unison lines and um, sort of that heavy um, guitar bass unison stuff that you associate with the early jazz rock. And um, David Torn and El Shanka have a ton of space to play. David Torn is an absolute virtuoso on this album. You may know David Torn from albums like Cloud About Mercury by Bill Bruford or the album that he made with Terry Bozio and Mick Kahn, which I can't remember the name of. Um, and those are fantastic albums, but if you know David Todd from those albums, he sounds completely different on here. And El Shanker, right, how many actual jazz rock albums can we go to that have El Shanker really soloing on? There's the One Truth Band, He's, he did his um, Touch Me There album, which has got certain fusion bits in. But apart from that, it's actually quite hard to hear El Shanker in an out and out fusion setting, and we have it here, and he's Violin solos are off the scale because El Shank has a sound that no other violinist has ever had. So that's the album I've got um, on my list. It was Tamna Voda, the album Dark that came out in 1988. We're now going to move on to some Algerian jazz rock with the band Rahman and the album Rahman that came out in 1980. And that sounds like this. So, this album is, is absolutely incredible. It's very eclectic, but it's very heavy. It doesn't sound like the sort of jazz rock that was coming out in 1980. Um, because they're an Algerian group, they have that sort of North African sound with loads, loads of the use of gap scales, harmonic minor scales, and that sort of twisting sound, which I absolutely love, which just, just sells this album for me. If I was going to describe this album to someone, I would say it's a mixture of magma, and the Mavish Nocturne, which is, which is such an incredible blend. It's heavy, it's powerful, but they also go off and play funky stuff. They have some avant-garde stuff on here. The playing is incredible, especially in the rhythm section. The drumming is absolutely thunderous. This is a real incredible album by this, by this Algerian jazz rock band. I've never spoken about any Algerian jazz rock. And as you can see, I am now I'm at the limit of what I know about this band, so I will move on. And I'm going to move on to another artist that I know absolutely nothing about. And it's a drummer called Vol Roland Vasquez. Roland's still around. He's based in Los Angeles. And he creates music that has a very strong Latin American salsa influence. In 1979, he had a band called The Urban Ensemble. And he made an album called The Music of Roland Vasquez. And it sounds like this. Now that is a funky album, right? It's a damn funky album, but it's also they're really playing on there. The drumming's incredible. Roland's compositions are heavy and the soloing is, is, is just monumental. This is an absolute classic jazz rock album, as I'm sure you just heard. Um, I can't say that much more about it. Um, I have got something, I couldn't find anything on Wikipedia for uh, Roland Vasquez, but I did find his website. So I'm going to read you out what he says on his website. He first worked as a drummer with R&B and rock groups in and around LA. He began writing for his jazz fusion bands during the mid 70s, receiving an NEA jazz performance Grammy in 1977, which helped establish his music and led to his production of urban ensemble, the music of Roland Vasquez, which he described as funky salsa bebop. Um, at the time when this album came out, people thought it was it was ahead of, of ahead of the time. I, th I think everyone was buying into this sort of funky jazz fusion, but most of it was people were doing it in a pretty lame way. This is if you're going to do sort of funky jazz, this is how you do it. Um, during those years, he did multiple studio projects, also performed regularly with his band, 
and then also other bands in and around California. Um, he worked with Shirley Walker, he worked with Don Randy, Willie Bobo, who I know he has played with Claire Fisher. I've actually got a Claire Fisher album, a great singer. Um, and he, he, I think he got a Grammy in 1982 for best Latin jazz album. So he's, he's, had a, he's had a good career. I've never heard of this guy, I've never heard of this album. I will move on now to two artists that you will know. And, well, you might know. <laughs> um, you'll definitely know one of them, I think. Um, so the next album I'm gonna look at is by an English pianist called Gordon Beck. Now, I know Gordon Beck because in 1968, I think, he made an album called Experiments with Pops, where he was one of the first, first artists to take pop songs and apply the sort of jazz thing to them. This is right at the beginning of jazz rock. It's a very important album in the history of jazz rock. On there is a very young John McLaughlin, and uh, he plays some incredible solos. So that's how I know Gordon Beck. And then later on, he cropped up a play on the on the Holdsworth album, None Too Soon. I did a little bit of research and I found out he'd also recorded two albums with Alan Holdsworth, which were just duet albums. One of which is called The Things You See, and the other one, I cannot remember the name of, right? So, uh, I didn't think I was gonna be talking about it, but Gordon Beck is actually an incredible um, jazz pianist. He made two albums under his own name with Alan Holdsworth on. He made an album in 1977 called Touching On. Uh, this is a very free jazz affair. It's very interesting to hear Alan Holdsworth in that context. Um, the drum on that is John Stevens, and Alan Holdsworth has made four albums with John Stevens in the late 70s, um, albums which he disowned. He only agreed for the first album to come out, um, which, um, when it came out, he got no pay for it. And then John Stevens released three more albums of basically studio out text, and it really upset Alan. And um, when you get deep into the Alan world, these, these four albums, um, they're like the mysterious albums. This, this whole period, these are the albums that sort of no one talks about, the, uh, the Gordon Beck albums and the John Stevens albums. The best of them is uh, Gordon Beck's album Sunbird that came out in 1979. It's not strictly a jazz rock album, it very very much errs on the side of jazz, but the inclusion of Alan Holdsworth on it and some incredible solos where his tone's different, it's a lot more bluesy and it's also a lot more jazzy. He's incredible on this. It's really interesting to hear Alan Holdsworth in this context and it sounds like this. This is a really monumental album and I've, I've put one of Alan's hot solos on this video so you can hear it but it's worth checking out Gordon Beck he was an absolute virtuoso pianist right talking about virtuoso guitarists let's move on to Pat Martino now we all know Pat Martino one of the greatest jazz guitarists of all time and we know that he really did plough a furrow he died quite recently but he ploughed a furrow which was definitely jazz guitar right in 1977, he made a fusion album, a jazz rock album called Joyous Lake, and it sounds like this. This is one of the greatest jazz rock albums ever made. Uh, I've been dying to talk about this on this channel. The playing is absolutely beautiful. The Pat Martino is just so interesting to hear him with that slightly thicker sound. It's not quite overdriven, but it's got a thicker sound to it playing in this jazz rock, rock context. Some of these compositions are so complex and it's really interesting to hear him weaving through sort of modality and also through chord changes. It's a funky album, it's an out there album. This is one of the great jazz rock albums of all time. Joyous Late by Pat Martino, which came out in 1977. Right, we are now in the last two. And I've left the most obscure till last, right? And I've also, with this album, this album is 
it made me laugh when I heard it. It's just out and out jazz rock, but it's so weird and strange and it's got so many different sounds on here. It's quite comedic. I absolutely love this album and it is called Funky Tramway and it is by somebody called Janko Nilevich. And this album sounds like this. album right it's got a choir on there it goes through all these different st styles but when they go for solos the solos are out there it's really is incredible now Janko Nilevich I found out was born on the 20th of May 1941 so you know it's only a few weeks ago ago he turned 82 he's still around this guy he's a pianist arranger composer he's from Greece right and um, He's based in France and he's most well known for creating library music and that is what this sounds a little bit like. This is out there jazz rock with a touch of library music sound to it. Um, the great Brian Bennett, the drummer with the shadows in the 70s, also made library music and he made a bunch of albums which are absolutely mind-blowing. Very similar thing. So this is the sort of French stroke Greek version of Brian Bennett. <laughs> right, I told you this is obscure. This album's absolutely incredible. I love the cover, I love the vibe, and it's, it's fun. It's, and it just keeps your interest. It goes all over the place. So I have now talked about nine albums. I have now come to the last album. If this was a top 10, this would without doubt be number one. If I was doing now a list of the greatest jazz rock albums of all time, I think this could well get in the top three. This is a mind blowing album. If I was doing the 10 greatest prog albums of all time, I think this would get in the top 10. This is an incredible album, right? So I'm about to tell you the story of one of the most interesting music musicians in jazz rock, prog, whatever you want to call it, right? A musician that is shrouded in mystery. Okay, so the musician in question is a guy called Herman Svebel, right? Who was born in 1958 and he brought one album out in 1977 called Svebel, right? And this album is bonkers, right? I'm going to play you a couple, like a sort of little bits from the album, just a few bits here and there. Now, this album was made when Herman was 17 or 18 years old, right? And I'm going to tell you the background to this. Jazz rock and prog fans, put your seatbelts on. You will never heard anything like this. So this is Svebel by Herman Svebel from 1977. Hopefully you've had the same reaction as me when I came across this album, which was only a few weeks ago. And I put it on, I just could not believe what I was hearing, right? So I thought, I've got to find out about this guy. This is one of the strangest stories in jazz, rock, prog, or contemporary music. This is bizarre, right? So, as I said, Herman Savelle was born in 1958 in Vienna, 
Austria, right? Now I've pulled this information off the internet from a number of sources, right? I'm gonna to have to read it because I don't know this. So as you know, normally this stuff comes off the top of my head. But this story is so strange that I wanna get the facts in here, right? So, he was born in Austria in 1958 and his mother was called Sonia Svebel, right? Sonia Svebel's um, little brother was Bill Graham. Now, Bill Graham was a concert promoter that did stuff with Santana, with the Grateful Dead, with Miles Davis. And he was the guy that put on all those incredible gigs at the Fillmore. When you see those Miles Davis albums, Bill Graham was one of the guys that took Miles and put him into a rock setting. So Bill Graham is really important for the history of jazz rock. But Bill Graham's over in the States. Herman is in Austria. So at the age of 16, right, he decides to go to America. Now, why does he go to America? Because at the age of six, he started playing piano, had classical training, and it became apparent that this guy was a child prodigy, right? Um, he was really into Chopin, he was really into Keith Jarrett, um, he was really into Frank Zappa, I think. You must have been listening to this album, right? Um, with this sort of virtuosity, was a very strange sort of almost like narcissistic character, I think from what I've read really between the lines. He seemed very confident with himself. He really believed that he was great and he was, he was very, in the early days, very forward in pushing himself. So at 16 years old, he gets on a plane and he goes to New York. A very similar story to the story of Jaco Pastorius. And it's interesting when we plot the story of this guy. So. He arrives in America, he's in New York, he's trying to make it, he's got a compositions under his arm, he's 16 years old. He's got some contacts with Bill Graham. He winds up walking into Roberta Flack's recording session for Feel Like Making Love, that album. He's around about 1974, he's a very young man. He walks into that studio and he walks up to the band and Roberta Flack and says, I am the greatest pianist in the world. They all burst out laughing, they go prove it. So he sits down and plays piano and the band and Roberta Black stand there open mouth looking at this little kid who is apparently the greatest pianist in the world. He's got classical down, avant-garde, jazz rock, jazz and he's got a fistful of compositions. With Roberta Flack behind him and Bill Graham he signs a deal with Arista, this is a major deal and he makes this album in 1977. This album is a just seems to do everything on it. It's incredibly virtuoso. His, his piano playing is unbelievable. It doesn't sound like anybody at all. He's got his own sound. The musicianship is, is just bonkers on here. Um, the, the musicians on this album is um, Michael Viscaglia on bass, never heard of him. Bob Goldman on drums, never heard of him. But we do have Dave Samuels on marimba and vibraphone, who is a classic uh, musician of jazz rock and Vadim Viadro on tenor, sax, clarinet and flute. Right, you've heard this album and I'm sure you're running to have a good listen to it. It's bonkers. Right, came out on Arista Records, it made a label and it absolutely flopped, right? Herman then goes back into the studio to start working on the next album and at this point, he seems to have had a nervous breakdown or something happened. There's an argument with the musicians in the group and at this point, he disappears. He absolutely disappears, right? Nobody knows where he is. There's a, there's a rumor he's living in um, San Francisco and he's keeping dogs and smoking a ton of marijuana, right? But people lose touch with him. His mother eventually um, registers him as a missing person, I think in 2002. So this guy absolutely disappears off the planet. This is one of the most bizarre stories in jazz rock I've ever come across. This absolute, you know, monster of jazz rock. One of the, apparently one of the greatest musicians. At 18 years old making an album like this. What would he have gone on to do? This is, this is mind blowing. Makes that one album. Nobody buys it. The album falls into obscurity and he disappears off the planet, right? Now you'd think that would be, um, the, the end of the story, but there's a twist to this, which is absolutely incredible. So um, his mom files for a missing persons report in 2002. Um, nobody knows where he is. Now, there's a Polish filmmaker called Katarzyna 
Kazira. I'll say that again, probably pronounce it wrong. Katarzyna <laughs> Kazria. She's a Polish artist and a filmmaker, and she's very interested in a psychological affliction called the Jerusalem, syn the Jerusalem Syndrome. God, there's too many big words in this video. Right, the Jerusalem Syndrome is a sort of mental illness where people visit Jerusalem, they're completely um, okay, you know, complimentous, and as soon as they reach that town, they become psychotic, often believing that Jesus Christ is coming, or they are Jesus, or they are being controlled by forces beyond themselves, right? And this happens a lot in Jerusalem. So she goes in 2012 to make a film in Jerusalem exploring the Jerusalem syndrome, and she um, ends up interviewing this guy that's living on the streets, um, drinking rainwater, eating whatever food he can get. He still says that he's an artist, right? And he has gone there and he is suffering with this thing called Jerusalem syndrome. Um, this could well be Herman's Fabel. It's not time for me to show up or on the screen right now, but I will. I mean, I am a light. I mean, like she just said to me, you are a light and the salt of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. He, he agrees to do an interview, and uh, when he does the interview, um, he will not allow his face to be um, seen. Now, I've tried to find out what I can about this film, and I have found on Vimeo a, a, a short extract from the film, and there is a guy on there who's talking about... Um, uh, the fact that he's disappeared from view and it's not ready for him to come back into view and uh, his face is hidden, it's just his arms. But from what you can see, he looks like a younger man than Herman would have been at this age. Herman would have been in 2012, around about 50, I suppose. Early 50s. Uh, and it doesn't look like that. This is, this is just a big mystery and I have told you everything that I know everything that I have been able to find out about this guy, but I do believe this is one of the greatest um, jazz rock and prog albums ever made. Uh, there's parts on it which compositionally sound like Frank Zappa, but they're even more out there. They're, this is bonkers. His piano playing's incredible. The soloing is incredible. The band's incredible as well. And um, when people make virtuoso albums, it often has this sort of tight sound of musicians really concentrating, trying to make sure they nail everything. This album does that, that, that sound, it's loose. It's, 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 um, you can hear sort of the room, especially on the saxophone, you can hear the room. I love the way it's recorded. I love the sound of it. This has just suddenly become one of my favorite albums of all time. And it's on Spotify. So you can go and listen to it right now. And when you get there and look up Herman's Fabel on there, I think at the moment he has 23 listeners a month. Right, so hopefully this video will up those listeners. So come on guys, get over to Spotify and listen to this album. And if I can get the people here in this album and I can see the listeners go up to Spotify, I will come back and report more. And I might even be able to find out a little bit more about Herman. Herman, if you're watching this, right, that album is unbelievable, right? You're an incredible musician, right? And I'm sure there's a lot of people, when I say a lot of people, there are people out here that do really appreciate what you do and we would love to know what you're up to. But, you know, he has his reasons. He has disappeared from the mainstream. Probably the best idea. So I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did enjoy it, please like because it helps the algorithm and I need my algorithm to be helped at all times by you. Um, if you want to see some more, you can subscribe and you can ring the notification bell and it will tell you when I'm bringing a video out. I tend to bring out at least three videos a week. Last week I actually brought out seven. Seven, one every single day, right? Um, if you want to support me doing this, uh, then please become a Patreon. And at the moment, if you visit my Patreon, you will get seven days for free. So you could check it out and see whether you like it. And I'm sure you will like it. So thanks for watching this video and I'll see you on the next one.